Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we plan to continue our discussion following Matthew 6.33, which is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's We're going to follow that out. All right. But first, we're going to pray. And we just thank you so much for joining us today. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We declare wholeness in every situation in everybody's life who hears our voice in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that you use our words to say your words and people hear what you're saying to them and speak to them individually as they're hearing us. And we just thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Yes, sir. So let's go to Matthew 6, 33 first, and then we're going to follow up. I have some other follow-ups to go with that. And I'll read it out of the Bible, even though we read it and we all know it by heart. So we started up higher. Let's go to 29. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not dressed like one of these. Okay. Why take thought about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither work nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not dressed like one of these. Therefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today here and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, or you of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. Therefore, take no thought about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought about the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the trouble thereof. So the, the starting verse was seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added into you. Now, we talked last week about what does seek mean? What does the kingdom mean? What does righteousness mean? We talked about all that. So you're going to go after with your whole heart God's kingdom. And if you're born again and you speak Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he's inside of you. So the kingdom is inside of you. And he's made you righteous and clean, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new and all things are of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So you become righteous. Okay, we talked about this last week. We're going to go forward. If you have any questions, just leave a comment and we'll get to you. All right. So the next thing I wanted to read was 2 Peter 1, 3. What was the 2 Peter 1, 3? 1, 3. Yeah, so in my version, modern English version, it says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence, by which he has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, so that through these things you might become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. We can, that's good. We can go further. This is this is awesome. For this, oh, this is good. Make every effort to add virtue to your faith and to, to your virtue knowledge and to your knowledge self-control and to your self-control patient endurance and to your patient endurance godliness and to your godliness brotherly kindness and to your brotherly kindness love. For if these things reside in you and abound, they ensure that you will never be useless nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the one who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted because he has forgotten that he was cleansed from former sins. Now, I mentioned that a minute ago. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new, and all things are of God. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. So if you don't want to fall back into sin and backslide, it's saying do these things. That's what I got out of that. Is that what you got out of that? Finish it. For in this way, the entrance into the into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly provided for you. So there's a whole yeah. section there. So it's so Second Peter one uh, three through eleven. I was I was actually that that scripture came to my mind this morning that pertaining to life and godliness because I, uh, the Lord showed me I had unforgiveness in this one area and I was like like and I was like well, I've been trying to forgive Lord and I can't. And the Lord's like, I gave you everything that pertains to life and godliness. I was like, oh, okay. Okay. Okay, Lord. Ephesians <laughs> 1, 3. This is saying the same thing. I, I, like I said, we've talked about this many times, but I think what we usually do is go over and over the same thing so people will know that, that what they have and who they are. Ephesians 1, 3. Hold on. 
one three Ephesians one three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before Him in love. We can keep reading, but the point is, He's given us. We just read a minute ago that He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And we, there's another reference that says that we lack no good thing. And, you know, of course, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The point we're making today, and I'm going to make it with a lot of different references. The point we're making today is you have everything you need. You know everything you need to know because God is on the inside of you and he has given you everything you need. Everything you need to, to conquer every situation in your life is inside you right now. Amen. You have no lack. You have no lack at all. Now, tapping into that is a thing. You you read the word, you spend time with God, you pray in the spirit. All those things you do to tap into the spirit and you get quiet. You be still and know that I'm God. You get quiet and you listen. However, you hear from God. The Bible says my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger they won't hear. So Amen. you hear from God. It's a matter of how you hear. Like I said, it could be a scripture. It could be something outside, you know, whatever. Whatever it is, you hear from God. Just I hear I hear through people. I hear through the word. I hear through uh, Christian books. I hear through Christian song. You know what I mean? It can be any type of way, you know? You're, I mean, you know, I mean, I hear through other people a lot, through you a lot. How do you hear, Leslie? I guess I get a thought. I get a thought. A thought or a scripture. Or a song, you know, leaving on a jet plane, and that's a song, but but it could be a, a um, prophetic thing. I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere, you know, something like that. Like my sister-in-law said that happened to her one time, that someone was prophesying over her and sang that song, you know. And then uh, she I like that. On a mission trip, but, you know, that's, so it's, you know, it's just however God talks, he, you know, songs, who use what you know, like. If you look, you read the Bible in the New Testament, Paul quotes um, poets, whatever. It's whatever you know. That's, you know, how God speaks to you. and He delivers it that way. And that's how God delivers it to you as well. So whatever you need to know, it's inside of you already. You have no lack. Let but me put it another way. Like, like, uh, <laughs> like, um, like there's a few things that I've been like in my Christian walk that I don't like about myself. And like one of them, I said, I had some unforgiveness that the Lord showed me. And then another one was sometimes my language is not as colorful. And um, the Lord, and I'm like, but I can't do this, Lord. And he's like, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because I gave you everything that pertained to life and godliness. And that just hit me this morning. So that's a lie. I'm lying to myself because, yes, I can. Because the Lord already gave it to me. Whatever I need, it's already in there. He wouldn't have commanded it if, if it wasn't in there in the first place to, to do the thing. You know, he knows how we work. He wrote the handbook. He knows how we work best. And he gave us everything to do to do the to do the things that he told us to do because he wants good for us, because he loves us. Well, that's true. So it's all in there. And let's look at first John two twenty. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. I have written to you not because you do not know the truth. But because you know it and because no lies of the truth. Who is a liar? Let's see. But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, whoever denies the Father and the Son is the Antichrist. Okay. But just you have anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. That's important. That's first John two twenty. And then Romans eight thirty two is really good. You probably know this one, but we're gonna read it anyway. So the point here, my whole point today, and I'm gonna keep saying it is that everything you need is inside. It's all inside like intel, okay? It's all inside you. It's a matter of you tapping into it. It's a matter of everything. We had a situation come up this morning, and what? It's inside. So it's all a matter of you getting it. So I, I see somebody work on cars all the time and get mad, but then you know what? The answer comes. The answer comes because it's in there. What is I, it to um, what? Okay, let's look at Romans 8.28, just because I can't just st start right in the middle of a verse, okay? Okay, 8.28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, 
he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That would be us. So that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. We're, we're the brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. I'm justified by faith in Christ. Amen. And those who he justified, he also glorified. I'm not sure what that means, but we'll go with it. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Here's my favorite scripture. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Oh my goodness. That's another one we can jump on. Yesterday we were talking to somebody. And that person was telling me how everybody in that person's family is jumping on them about their faith. And so we looked it up in the Bible, you know, in Matthew 10, 34 and 35, I believe. And then Mark 10, 34 and 35. It's right in that general area. I can't, I'm not going to say that's it. Mark 10, 29 and 30. Matthew, I'm not sure. But it's in Matthew 10. Either way, both those, both of those references from Jesus are saying, they persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. Get over it, basically. You're going to, you know, who are you better than me? I didn't come to bring peace between your family and you. I came to bring a sword. So it's just, you're going to get it. It's coming at you. I've gotten persecution from my church people, from my family, everything. Okay? So, and then I took it personally, like, I must have a terrible personality. People must hate me. But I, but I believe the Bible says that He hates us for His. That they hate us for His sake. So that's something we it's need. It's the to demons inside of them, Leslie. Yeah. Remember we talked about this. That's the demons inside of people. Uh, what's that scripture we always talk about when we're on the phone? Uh, alone. Uh, it's a uh, Ephesians. Uh, it's not the weapons of our warfare are not carn. No, it's it's the one one where. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places. Every time you, you, when you get saved, every demon around or in someone is going to rise up and be like, Ooh, Ooh, I see Jesus and that person. I don't like it. So let, and then he's going to whisper in that person's ear, like, Ooh, let's cause trouble for that person because it's, ha I mean, I'm telling you, it'll happen. It will happen. It does happen. It is a reality though. And I, I've done taking it, I've internalized it. I'm thinking I just must have a terrible personality all these years, but it's, it's God in me that, that, ag that stirs everything up around me. That's what it is. You know, I might, I might not be perfect with my personality, but still it's God in me. I walk in the room and they're like, ah, so keep that in mind. But we've been given, I need to see your face. We've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. So we have every tool we need in the tool belt to handle everything that comes our way. We don't have to be under any circumstances because God is in us at work to will and to do his good pleasure. And when you get saved um, and you're trying to go a, a direction that's positive, you will have opposition. The Bible says so. You will have opposition. I mean, an opposition will come hard. It'll come hard because the devil's trying to knock you off your tracks. And, and he, I mean, just recently this has happened to me, you know, I was on a good, good road, a good road where I was positive and everything was good and I was happy. And, and then the thing happened with David and I'm like, and you know, it took me down. It took me all the way down. And, and I was like, you know, and, and I, what I should have done, the Lord just showed me this this morning, what I should have done was quoted scripture back to the devil and said, no devil, this is this. And I did that. I did that for a while. Well, and then and then it wore wore me down, but like uh, I, you know, don't grow weary, grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap the reward. So what what I, what I let it take me down, I, I grow weary. So you know when when you're when you're getting, you know, the devil's going to come at you when you're trying to walk with God. He's just going to, especially if you have a purpose, especially if he has a you know he has a plan for everyone, but especially if he has a plan for you, and he's trying to raise you up to a, a different position in life. And he's going to come out. You, the devil's going to come out. You with both barrels. And he did that with me. And you got to stand on that word. The Lord showed me that this morning. You got to stand on that word. And every time the devil tries to knock you off your tracks, because he wants you to backslide, he wants you to go right back to the vomit you came from. And and you know, and and if you're not careful, you will. That you know, you know, you were just reading how to not stumble. You know, that's serious. Like do those things because you you don't want to stumble. Stumbling is what I always did. And, you know, I just, that's not, that's not in my, in my life anymore. But so just remember when the devil comes out, he's both barrels. You stand on God's word. You you speak God's word 
all the time. Just keep speaking it, speaking God's word out loud because, you know, let's, sorry, go, to, let's go to the next one. First Corinthians three, 22 and 23. What? That's right. Right in the middle of a verse. I'm going to start at 18. Start at 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in, in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise are futile. Let no one boast in human leaders, for everything is yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. Everything is yours, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So now, what was the scripture? All is, everything's yours. Everything's yours. We've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness. Oh. We've got all the spiritual blessings in the heavens in Christ. Everything is ours because we're in Christ and everything belongs to Christ. It basically got, follows through and says that, you know. It says that. So it's just like, it's all ours. It's all going to be ours. Everything. And you know, the angels are sent out to minister to the heirs of salvation. And that's me. You know, so everything is set up for us. Now, we just have to, you know, make it like, think about the kings and priests. How do they handle things? They make a de de declaration and and whoever handles it, handles it. Like Job twenty two twenty eight says, decree a thing and it shall be established. So you're going to, what you're going to ask the Lord what he wants, what's his mind on it, or you're going to listen and hear his mind on it. And then you're going to make a declaration what the declaration is. What is the mind of the Lord on this? How does he want to handle it? Or you may have, he may show you with your eyes how to handle it. Either way, God's going to show you how to handle it. And you're going to handle it because you got everything you need inside you. You're, you've got all the tools. It's all there. You just have to, okay, Lord, what direction are we going here? What direction are we going here? And that's what we have to do. We have to find out what direction we're going. And then we walk in that direction. The Lord, the Lord's been dealing with me this week about getting a vision and writing it down, you know, um, I'm like, Lord, what's your vision? Like, what is my vision for, for my life? You know, and, and, and I believe we fail if we don't have some kind of vision and, you know, see our purpose, you know, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what my, my purpose is right now, but the Lord show me, you know, and like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, uh, the people perish, uh, for what's that scripture where the people perish that don't have a vision, lack of knowledge, lack of knowledge, yeah. lack of knowledge or really, where there is no vision, the people perish where there is a vision. That's the one. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the, ask the Lord what, what, what it is you're supposed to be doing in this, in this time of your life. What did it, what did it, what is it, what is your, what is your purpose for me here in this place or in this, in this season? And then get the vision and write it down. That's going to be in Proverbs 29, 18 through 27. Let's read John 15, 7. Okay. I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the world I've, word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather <laughs> they gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this and that you produce much fruit and prove me to prove to be my disciples. Yeah. Mm, that's good. Y'all get bored. The whole chapter is amazing. <laughs> Actually, right, yeah. fifteen and seventeen are amazing the whole yeah but it's really good so up here in, in verse three that get, get that one you are already clean because of the word i spoke to you that's really good so his words make us clean that's that's really cool yeah, that's good i heard a scripture this morning that i really liked and i, I was in pro, uh i forget which one but it's trust god do good trust god do good <laughs> i thought that was good if that's what it is like trust god and uh, just keep doing good you know i mean like that's 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 it right there you know trust god do good yeah one of the mottos of one of my universities is do good on the highest level you know 
<clears throat> on the highest level you can. Okay, so we did that one. I, oh, dog. I, I only got one reference. I actually got a couple more. So Psalms 1, I don't know if that's where we want to go yet. Acts 17, 28, that's one we need to know. And then Galatians 2, 20. Now, I said we, Marcy and I talk about these all the time. All the time. Because I believe that that's where, you know, what we're trying to get is realizing who we are, what we're, how we're functioning. So in Acts 17, 24, God who made the world and all things in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hands, nor is he served by men's hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives all men life and breath in all things, he has made from one blood every nation of men to live on the entire face of the earth having appointed fixed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, so perhaps they might reach for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to suppose that the deity is like gold or silver, or stone, or an engraved work of art, or an image of the reflection of man. Now, the point of that whole section was then in him we live and move and have our being so when i reach out and touch somebody it's jesus touching him right anything i'm doing anything I, place i'm going i'm in christ and therefore satan can't see us you know because we're hidden in christ ooh. that's galatians 2 20 that we're hidden in christ right oh that's good i never thought about that meaning that you're actually hidden you're hidden in christ in god yeah read that find that one hidden in christ in god yeah I might find that one hidden in Christ. I think it's Galatians 2. I've read it. I just never thought about it actually meaning that. I've read it many times. I just like, wow, that's interesting. That's good. I heard a story once. Um, this late, this man. So Colossians 3 3. Look at Colossians 3 3. You look up Colossians okay. 3 3, and I'll tell you the story. So this man okay. is a preacher, and his sister in law went to a psychic. To try to look him up and she said every time she tries to search for him all she could see was a cross so oh she, wow she couldn't see nothing about him if she could just see a cross that's crazy that's a neat story wow I, that just blows my mind i never thought about that that is cool i've never known that we were hidden in christ i mean i've read that a thousand you know you read stuff sometimes a thousand times and you're like and you don't get it until god like lights it up for you for you you read three what three through what so if you've been raised with Christ, I'm going to go start at the beginning. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden in Christ, hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is your life, good, that's the one, the one you told me to read, but I'm going to read four too. When Christ, with, when Christ, who is your life, appears then you will also appear with him in glory but yeah hidden in christ that's cool well, neat let's, well let's read galatians 2 20 it says the same thing basically uh i have been crucified with christ and i know it and i no longer live but christ lives in me the life i now live in the body i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me i do not set aside the grace of god for if righteousness comes through the law then christ then Christ died for nothing. Okay. So That's the whole thing. Christ there. That's two different places. Remember, Paul's saying all this stuff. A lot of the New Testament Paul wrote. So a lot of the stuff he just says it to different different churches is what he's doing. So we're hidden in Christ and God. We have every tool we need. Our lives are his life. He's just we are like in Second Corinthians five, it says we are his his ambassadors to the earth begging people to come to god that's what god's heart is that his people come back to him god's heart is that he wants a relationship with his people god created us because he wanted a relationship with us jesus came back jesus came and died so that the the distance between us and god will be ended so god will be inside of us so there's no space that we can always connect with god that was the whole point of jesus coming back to the earth do you have anything julie no i was just listening to you that's really good you know and i was just thinking about how cool that is i, I mean he just blows my mind like 
uh, that John Van Garber we were watching was talking about the angels, and uh, he was talking about his angel, his guardian angel that he sees all the time. He said, was watching his family one day, just watching him. And he's like, can I help you? He wasn't trying to be rude to the angel. He's like, can I help you? Because you're just watching us and smiling. And he goes, we don't have families like this in heaven. We were created strictly to serve God. And, uh, and you know, he's our father, but you guys have families on earth. And he goes, and we learn from your families. And I was thinking about, you know, that is so cool that God created us to have a family. I mean, like, wow, the creator of everything and that is love itself incarnate loves us and we are so imperfect and so i mean i know personally I, i'm just like wow god you love me and he knew what i was like from he, he said he called me from the foundation of the world so before the world even was he called me and he knew all the things i was going to do what you know the not good things and he still loved me and he loved me when i didn't even love him when i didn't want anything to do with him and he died for me when i didn't want anything to do with him that's mind blowing to me. It blows my mind. Well, there's a, there's, I don't know it, but there's a reference in Romans that says that while you were yet sinners, he died for you. And he already knew. He, the Misty Edwards sings a song, song that says, He knew what he was getting into when he called me. You know, none of that took him by surprise. He knew how you were going to be. He knew all that. None of it took him by surprise. So God knew us. Like he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He already knew who we were going to be and all that. Yet he wanted us anyway. And he's he's out here with open opportunity here. Here I am. Come see me. Come have a relationship with me. Come walk with me. And I'll show you how it is. And if you read Ephesians 3.20, let's read that. You probably read it. And you know what I was, also, also what I was thinking about that. We were talking about how God loves us. And you know, there's people that, that are just, you know, it, that I know personally, they're just, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I say this, but it's what's funny is I'm just as bad if I'm not worse. But there's people that are just, you know, not nice to us, just are not nice in the world, just are not good people. And God loves them just the same as He loves us. And that's why we're called to love because these unlovely people, these mean people, these ugly, ugly human beings. The only way they're getting to heaven is through us showing them love, unconditional love, loving our enemies, forgiving, you know, and that's the only way they're coming to heaven is through us. And, you know, God loved them just as much as he loved us, you know, just exactly as much. He he imagined them up in his head and like this little mean person is, is you know he created them knowing just what they would do too and and loves them just as much so like as christians we don't get to pick and choose who we forgive and and who we love and and if, if they're mean to us we don't love them and, and if they're weird we don't put them out of our lives we just have to love because that's the only way people are getting to heaven yeah let's read this it's uh, 14 for this reason i bow my knee to the father of our lord jesus christ for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would give you according to the riches of his glory power to be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man and that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of god now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or imagine according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So he was telling I us- I prayed that prayer for my family. Which one? You pray that, that, that whole, that little thing, that little prayer from like 14 to, to 19 there. I pray that for my family. That's good. <clears throat> so it's really our job as women. I don't know if it's everybody's job, but I think it's our job is we're supposed to be supportive in prayer and everything else of everybody else. This is, we're here, we're here to serve. And we're here not to be about ourselves. We're here to be about other people. And that's basically what we're here for. To just hold them up. Like, you know, in the story of Moses, you hold up Moses' hands, hold their hands up so they can do the things they're called to do. That's what we're here for. And you know, you know how we always say, talk about granny praying do you know that I'm probably the only one, maybe you too, that are praying for my grandkids? I'm probably the only one that are praying for my kids, you know, really praying. Now, not to say Donna didn't and stuff like that. So if I don't pray and if I neglect my prayers, who's going to pray? 
You see what I'm saying? I mean, we have a responsibility. Even if, even you know, even 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 if even if the relationship isn't good, there, you're, we're still praying. You know, I, I I don't care if they get mad at me and don't talk to me. We're I'm still praying. You know. Yeah, we have a family member right now who's not speaking to us. We continue to pray for that person because we know that person is struggling. But we're not in a stri- We're not going to get in strife or anything. We're just going to keep continue to pray and trust that God is going to take care of that person. We're not hating. We're just. You know, you keep peace. It's like a dance. Relationships are like a dance. If one person's dancing and the other person isn't dancing, it's not a relationship. It's just, it's ended. It's like you can't you can't end a fight. You can start, stop a fight by not fighting, you know. If somebody's going to be rude or whatever, you don't have to be the other person. I'm going to be rude back. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. So we don't have to have any wrath coming back we just have to be like i'm not gonna do it i'm not protecting you can love from a distance you can love from a distance and there's some people some people you have to love from a distance but you still have to love and that's where the lord's dealing with me this week you know i don't know that i was that i was walking in any kind of love in that area and i'm like and the lord really dealt with me this morning about it i'm like you know you still have to love you know you still have to love even even you can't you know even though i'm not participating doesn't mean doesn't mean i can have anger over here i have to let that go i still have to forgive i still have to love and the lord's been really dealing with me about that this morning is is i'm not allowed to walk in unforgiveness that's a command and that's a command for my own good not because jesus loves me and knows the handbook on how i work and knows that if i have unforgiveness in me then i'm not going to work very good then the body that he created, the mind that he created, the spirit that he created to do something is not going to work if I'm walking in unforgiveness. And he he told me not he told me he commanded me to forgive for my good, you know, for my good, because he'll deal with the other person. I'm the one that has Jesus living in me, so he wants me to forgive for my benefit. My cousins have reminded me over and over again that tomorrow is not promised to anyone, and so you better fix the relationship if you can fix it now, because people have a tendency to go on to the next life without us fixing it. And it it becomes so sad because then you can't fix it anymore. So if as much as it lies within us, live at peace with all men is what it says in Romans 12, eight, I think you live at peace with all men. Peace doesn't mean, mean absence of war. It means make it right with every, you know, make, make it whole. If you've taken something, give it back, whatever you can, whatever with uh, as much as it lies within you, as much as it lies within you, if it doesn't, if it doesn't lie within you to fix it, then there you are. But as much as it lies within you, live at peace, make everybody whole around you as much as it lies within you. And that's what we're supposed to do as much as it lies within us. And I don't have uh, the answers are inside me. They haven't tapped out yet as how to handle certain situations, but we're going to live at peace with all men and how I live at peace with some people is just letting them be. And pray, praying from a distance, praying from a distance, and declaring wholeness over them, and letting them be. And you know, I found that that some people in in my life that when I'm near them and I see all the chaos, that it's harder for me to pray, and it's harder for me to pray with uh, conviction. It's harder for me to believe when I pray. But when they when I have a little distance between us, and I'm not saying you know get people out of your life to pray for them. I'm saying, but sometimes when I get a little distance, I can pray and have a little more faith because. I, I don't see the chaos, but I know my father's working. He's working, he's working, and I, and I don't see the daily, um, you know, the sin in their life or whatever's going on. I just know, I just, I, I, it's just me and God, and I'm like, God, I know who you are. I don't have to, you know, I, I'm, I'm not seeing what they're doing because that doesn't matter what they're doing because God's still working. You know, he's not, he's not turned his back on anyone. If he called me to pray, then he's called them, you know, or he wouldn't have called me to pray for them. You know, I believe that like if God put it on my heart, for instance, that guy in the salon that day I told you about that, I, that I knew that was a trafficker. And I, I, you know, I know that he told me that to pray for this man. And if he had told me that, if he specifically went to all that trouble and went to all that thing to tell me to pray for a man, then obviously he's called this man and he wants this man in the kingdom. So like, you know, just because just because I'm not around that person, sometimes I pray better and I pray with more faith when I'm not around the person's all I'm saying. I'm not saying get people out of your life so you can pray for them. That's not my point. But sometimes that happens, you know. Well, I find myself driving down the road praying for people. All, you know, as I drive, I drive a lot. 
So I find myself praying for people. I mean, they just my it's they just flow through my mind like like waves. And as the waves come through, I'm like, oh, I'll pray for that person. I'll pray for that person. It's just it's just a wave of, of who, who we need to pray for. Sometimes the wave gets angry. I get angry stuff coming through. So it's like you got you got to control that those waves in your mind. You know, sometimes though, when you're angry with somebody, it's I found out sometimes I'm angry with somebody. I find out a little bit later that they were going through something, and that the devil was against them, and I should have been praying life and wholeness instead of getting mad at them and agreeing with whatever was attacking. You know, it's something right. Weird. You know, uh, if you're ever angry with somebody, stop and pray. The Bible does say that somewhere. I can't tell you where the reference is now. But if you're ever I heard, somebody, stop and pray for them because you don't know what they're going through. You don't. And usually the people that hurt you, I mean, not no, not usually, always the people that hurt you, it's because they're hurting. Like I can remember people coming up to me when I was hurting and I mean, I was hurting and, and they would, you know, be nice to me and I might bite them you know and and the reason i bit them was not because i didn't want them to be nice to me or want them in my life was because i was coming from a place of deep deep pain i heard something this morning from joyce and i love it she said she changed she said the one thing she figured out in her whole life in her 70 whatever years was if you hurt me the first thing i'm going to do is pray the second thing i'm going to do is make a commitment not to talk about them and the third thing i'm going to do is tell god if they need help let me know she said that's the one thing out of all the years of preaching, if she had to pick one thing that she learned out of her 40-something years of preaching, that's what she would tell you. And I thought that was good because that's how I want to live my life. If I'm angry with someone, first thing I'm going to do is pray. Second thing I'm going to do is make a commitment not to talk because I like to vent. We call it venting, but really it's just gossiping. And and that's what it is. I mean, you know, and so like the Lord's been dealing with me about that, you know, um, cover a man or you're supposed to cover people's sins that you love. And you're not supposed to talk about it. If you really need to talk about him to somebody, talk about him to Jesus. You know, you don't need to, you know, because once you say a thing about someone, even if, even if the other person doesn't want to receive that about that person, let's say I said, I just made, a, I don't know, made up something about you that was ugly. And then I said that to your daughter and then, you know, and so every time she sees you, whether she believed it or not, she's going to think about that thing. And it's already out there, you know, whether it was true or not. And uh, so he's like, you know, don't talk about people. And I love that. I love what she said because we don't, you know, I, I'm a venter because my, my, the way I deal with process emotions is to talk about them to somebody. But then after I walk away from my venting slash gossiping, I feel ugly inside. I feel really ugly and I feel really bad. So my venting is not godly. That's not godly. And, and you know, I can write it down. I can talk to Jesus about it, but I don't need to say bad things about other people. Even if that's how I'm really feeling, I can say that to God because God can handle it and it's not going to go any further. But I don't need to vent slash gossip about people anymore. You know, like if I'm angry because, you know, first of all, it, it, if I don't take it to God first, the, the situation is not going to resolve itself. It's, it's not going to be resolved because God's the only one that can resolve anything. The Bible says in Proverbs, I don't have the reference, that he who repeats a matter separates chief friends. And I understand I feel the same way after I say something like about somebody, you know, I trash them or whatever. I, you feel dirty because it's not right. It's not right. Because what we're doing is we're allowing our authority that's in Christ to speak against somebody else. So it's really, we really have to work on shutting up. Because like, like, our words do have power. They do have power. And I, I didn't believe that for years, but they do have power. Our words over people have power. And so when you take our authority and we use it to badmouth someone, you know, and that doesn't hurt. You know who that hurts? That hurts us. You know, because God didn't, like I said, God wrote the handbook. So he told us not to do that because it hurts us. Like Joy, like Joyce said this morning, she said some, <clears throat> she said, she said, you know, when someone talks bad about me, she goes, I have the, the, the creator living inside of me. I'm good. She goes, I'm going to be good. She goes, but I need to pray for you because you're doing damage to your own life when you talk about me. Because she's a child of God. I like that. That's true. And Joyce. So who are we hurting? Joyce is 80. Huh? Joyce is 80. Is she 80? I, th I thought she was 77. But dang, she's 80 now? Wow. Last recording, I saw she was 79. So yeah, she's 80. Um, Yeah. And she's still alive. Thank God. Yeah, I love her. Joyce, Joyce has really helped our lives. I heard somebody the other day call her a... a a heretic i'm like 
Okay. No, she's not. No, she's not. <laughs> People, you know, no, she's not. I, that lady <laughs> blessed my life. I've been, that lady has spoken into my life. And, you know, I went through a stage where, you know, my son would be like, oh my gosh, she's a televangelist with all the money, you know? And I was like, oh, you know that I don't care. You know, God has used that lady in my life in such a mighty way that I couldn't even tell you. I've grown with her since, you know, since she began, I began watching her when she began just about. And, uh, my, my faith and, and spiritual walk has grown as she has. So it's, it's been interesting. Joyce. What's that scripture you always tell me that, you know, like if you said it, we were talking about one time, I think it was Jeff actually that said it. He was talking about, you know, it doesn't matter which, which, uh, cause I always wonder like, which, uh, which type of Bible should I get? I'm trying to always find the Bible that's the most accurate, you know? And what's that scripture you always tell you and Jeff say that it's, it doesn't matter which Bible you get cause it's in you. You would like, you know, we were reading stuff like that. Today. 31, 30. In, in the last days, I'm going to put the law upon their hearts. No longer will you teach your brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. It's Jeremiah 31, 31. Look around in that direction. Jeremiah 31. Okay. It's in uh, 31. So 31 says a new covenant. So Jeremiah 31, 31. Surely the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took him by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, although I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law within them. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for the all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them, says Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I remember their sin no more. That's Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. So we've covered a couple of different things today. We've covered Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We've covered 2 Peter 1, 3, which says we've been giving everything that pertains to life and godliness. We've covered Ephesians 1 3, which means it says that we've been, been given all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. We've covered uh, 1 Corinthians 3 22 that says all things are ours and we are Christ and Christ is God's. We've covered 1 John 2 20 that says we know all things. And somewhere it says the anointing teaches us all things. So the Holy Spirit inside of us is teaching us everything we need to know. We're connected. It's like an umbilical cord. We're connected. And it all comes straight through there and we get everything we need. He is our source and we get everything we need from him. Therefore, there's nothing we lack. The Lord is our shepherd. We always are shepherd. We shall not want. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit uh, brings us, brings anything to my remembrance that we need to remember any words, you know, any word of God that we need to remember. He, the Holy Spirit, man, he's amazing. I mean, like, Anytime I go to God, I mean, he teaches me all day and he's so gentle. Like me and Dave were talking and I, Dave, Dave wanted to correct me on something. And, and, uh, he tried actually, and I don't listen to people <laughs> and he was like, and, uh, and so I, I, it was something I later prayed about. And then the Lord showed me. And when the Lord showed me, he shows me gently and kindly and in a way that I can understand. And then I will, I will change a thing. People can't make me change a thing. I'm too stubborn. But when the Lord shows me, he shows me the Lord, the Holy Spirit will teach us, just teach us so gently and so kindly and say, look, you know, in this area that, that you need correction, he'll correct us. He'll remind us of the word. And oh, there was one thing I was going to say about the, the seek first the kingdom of God. I heard Gloria Coben say this many moons ago, and I took this to heart. You know, and it really is a thing in my life. It seek first the kingdom of God. And when I take that quite literally and when, I get up in the morning if I can, if at all possible, if I don't like have a whole sleep thing going on and get up in the morning and seek God first thing in the morning. And there's something about that. And some people can't do that. And some people aren't morning people, but there's something about it when there's nothing going on, there's no noise and you're up with God and it's just you and God in the morning and the, and the sun's breaking or whatever. There's something about putting God first in that first part of your day. And I take that, I mean, I take that so literally, because, you know, I, and I don't always do a perfect at it, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm telling you, there's something about that. There's something about that. Even if you have to get up an hour earlier and lose an hour of sleep, man, when nobody's up and it's just you and God, there's something about that first morning hour with God. It, it'll, it'll, it'll start your day off in a whole different way. 
But anyway, that's all I got. I do that as I drive. I pray, like I said, as I drive. So we've covered a lot of different things. I will leave the notes at the bottom of the screen when we're done. Uh, Julie starts her new job next week, so keep praying for Julie's job. My yes, mom, please. My mom lost her husband, so we got to pray for her. Her name is Pauline. Yes. Um, my son, pray for Zachary and Taylor. Just pray for them. They need prayers. Um, uh, we lost we lost a guy in our uh, in our recovery community this week, and I didn't know him personally. I've seen him in a meeting or two, but he was a young guy. He looked like maybe in his thirties. And uh, they would said he was clean for a long time, and I guess he just, you know, did one of them things where he just used once, and it didn't, it didn't do good. And uh, so pray for his family. And I, th- I forgot his name, Sean. His name was Sean. And pray for his family because everybody just loved him. Apparently, he was a really, really sweet guy. And uh, you know, lift and uh, lift up the addicts because, um, man, there's some good people in in the addiction community. People that are addicted as we speak. And they love the Lord. Many, many of them love the Lord with all their heart, and they just can't stop. So pray for them. Thank you, Spirit. So we take authority over that spirit of addiction. We take authority over it. We tell it to go to the high places. The blood of Jesus is against you. Yes. Free addiction. Jesus, my neighbor's even addiction. I declare wholeness over my neighbors. I declare wholeness over them. I draw a bloodline around this property again. I draw a bloodline around the people yes. that we're listening to. I plead the blood of Jesus over you. Yes. The enemy, the enemy, the Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I plead the blood of Jesus over you. You are, you are, if you're born again and you say, speak Jesus as your Lord, you are a child of God. God is living on the inside of you. I declare wholeness over your life. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Yes. And I declare wholeness over your whole family. Yes, Jesus name. And we thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us, Lord. We declare wholeness over everybody who listens to us. And everybody who listened to us, we thank you for coming today. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for coming to see us every week. We look forward yes. to seeing you again. And God bless you. God bless you. Love you, Leslie. Love you, I love you, Marcy, Linda, uh, Laura, Crystal.